You ready? Mm-hmm. Put my faith in you, Tom. Steve? Well, I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Three. Stop breathing in the microphone. <laughs> You're like Darth Vader. (laughs) I'm ready. (laughs) Here we are, Real Recovery Talk. I am your host, Tom Conrad. And to my right, we have... Ben B. Ben B and... Steve B. (laughs) Ben B and Steve B in the house. First things first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into this podcast. If you're listening on the podcast app, thank you for that. If you're listening on a, well, let's see, we're on Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google play music. Um, uh, uh, I think there's a, um, another one out there. There's a bunch, but just pick one, whatever one that you enjoy. Just listen to it on that. And if you are watching on YouTube, Definitely, definitely thank you for watching on YouTube. You can always leave us a comment. If there's a topic that you want to uh, hear about, you know, you just let us know. Give us a comment, and uh, I know what we're going to talk about today. But let me finish with the homework part of it. If you would like to reach out to myself or Ben, you could always email us, Tom at realrecoverytalk.com and ben at realrecoverytalk.com and ultimately what we are trying to do is turn your mess into your message your message that was good ben that's good well said (laughs) all right steve thanks for coming on absolutely um i i do know what we're going to talk about today ben are you ready Uh, i'm ready hit me with it tom excited But first, I do think that there's something that we need to draw attention to because Ben sent me this video on Facebook Messenger, and we're going to leave the the actual business name out, but I do think it's something that we can draw attention to just for a few minutes. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Um, There was a, there's a company that is pushing ads to people through social media, and I've gotten this a couple times too, on Instagram in particular, and the one that you sent me was the first that I had seen of it, but it in particular said um, F Rehab, and what was the rest? Something along the lines of, we'll get you your Suboxone within 24 hours over the phone. Hmm. Yeah, and the one that I saw on Instagram was something along the same lines of, Get Suboxone prescribed to you online. No need to visit the doctor. Click here, yada, yada, yada. And uh, I think that is absolute utter BS. There's a lot of them for Adderall and benzos nowadays, too. Like, you want to talk about setting the bar low, keeping somebody active in their addiction? There you go. Like, it's one thing, you know, you can go on Amazon and buy whatever you want, but now you literally can go on whatever platforms these are, Instagram, Facebook, and stuff, and just get your Suboxone script, too. I'll I'll tell you what's my philosophy with it in terms of Suboxone, and you you chose to go that route. Your addiction journey is not done. You know what I mean? Like, you're still on it. On the mic, Steve. You're still going to be... You're still an active addiction. I mean, and look, there's the possible pro. The only pro that comes to mind is like, okay, you're no longer doing fentanyl. You know what I mean? Possibly. Um, but you're in terms of being an active addiction, that's still that's going to go on for possibly a very long time. And you're no, you're not in the solution yet, if that's what you know one wants to do. So I just I just find it frustrating whenever I see this kind of stuff because. Again, and if you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time, you know our opinions on Suboxone. It can be used in a certain situation, but I feel my opinion is those situations are few and far between. And people that sit here and argue that Suboxone and medically assisted treatment is the best form of treatment. And, you know, according to this ad, F rehab, F meaning uh, F and Uck. you know we're a family friendly show here that's so ridiculous because i i mean i don't 
listen, in the end, I'm not a research junkie. I don't get on PubMed and read all these research papers and, you know, all this stuff. All we can speak on is our experience. And when you see this kind of stuff, it's like you have to ask, what is the real motive behind this? And I don't want us to put our tinfoil hats on and, you know, start talking conspiracies and all that stuff. But I think it's definitely, um, it hurts the overall cause Mm -hmm. of what we're trying to do. You know, supposedly, you know, fentanyl is this big, big deal and everything. And like, you know, we're trying to do our best to, to get rid of fentanyl or, you know, all this stuff that ever, you know, all the politicians and everybody are saying, or maybe they're not saying and should be, but there is no fight against the opioid epidemic that I have seen. There really isn't. I mean, it's very hard for some people to get treatment. And if they do get treatment, this is the type of treatment that they're now being marketed, which is just swipe up on Instagram, fill out a couple forms, and we're going to give you a script of Suboxone. So let me say this. If, like Tom said, if you've been listening to the show, I want to reiterate my personal opinion there are cases, there are times, there are clients where medically assistant treat medically assisted treatment is a good option. You know, you've got your fifty year old junkie that's been shooting dope for twenty five years, and the chances of them going abstinent because their body has changed so much biologically speaking from from years and years of use, like that's a good case. The the cases that aren't are the eighteen year old who dabbled in fentanyl for three months and now going to the doctor and mom and dad are saying, and the doctor saying, Oh, go on some boxing. And, and what, what they're doing is keeping them physically dependent upon a substance, which over the course of time is going to degrade their biological state to begin with, you know, and down the line, they're going to be even more physically dependent on this substance. Then they're going to feel they need it more, even stronger mentally, but let me let me tell you what my issue with this is. It is hard enough for professionals such as ourselves to sit in front of somebody like Tom, Tom, myself. You know, we we do a lot of interventions, and we sit down and we get somebody's story. And when we're sitting in front of them in person, it's still hard Ooh. to know what the truth is because their their perception of the truth may be false. So do you mean to tell me that a doctor on a Zoom session can get a get a proper assessment of somebody that calls in and says, here's what I'm doing? I can only speak for myself when I had all those psychiatry, psychologist visits and, and going to the doctor. Here I am hooked on opiates and sitting in front of them, I'm able to take my perception, my lies, even intentionally sometimes, and get substances that I want, you know, and I don't know if y'all are aware, you know, there's a big Adderall shortage right now. No, yeah, I was not aware. So check it out. Uh, uh, The pharmacies are low on Adderall. Let me throw this out there. I haven't done a ton of research, but I've seen a couple articles on this topic. Um, But with that being said, I believe a lot of this was created through the COVID epidemic, right? Where pandemic, which one is it? Pandemic? Yeah, there we go. Mm-hmm. But anyway, with when COVID came about, all these these clinicians, doctor's offices, medical doctors all switched to this online stuff and started prescribing online because they didn't want to see people in person, you know, to stop the transmission of COVID. I think they need to revert back to what they were originally doing and see people in person because to call it what it is, you know, there's an Adderall shortage right now. There has been a dramatic increase in the amount of people that have gotten on Adderall since COVID mm-hmm. has started. Because, you know, with COVID, people are isolated. They started drinking more. They started having more mental health issues. And all of a sudden, like, oh, I need meds. They jump on a Zoom session with the doctor. Ten minutes later, your stuff's in the mail or pick it up at the pharmacy or whatever the case may be. They're, like, literally eliminating the entire clinical assessment process. Yes. That it, So if you look at it just from that perspective in itself, I want to go back to what Tom was saying about the motive. You know, again, we don't want to put our tinfoil hats on, but let's just call it what it is. 
there's a huge opportunity for pharmaceutical companies to push these drugs even easier. Yeah. And right now, let me throw this out there. This has been a huge topic for me late lately. And ha- tell me if you guys have seen the same thing, but how many clients are we getting in treatment where Adderall is a significant part of their bio pre-assessment screen? A lot. The, the generation that came up on Adderall is ending up in treatment now. Mm-hmm. And like literally, I can't tell you how many clients we've had in the last couple years that are now doing meth, but have been prescribed Adderall since they were seven, eight years old. It's crazy. Like my first drug, like a lot of people's was marijuana. Now a lot of these people, they're, you know, when they were kids when they were prescribed Adderall. Yeah, it's it's one carbon molecule different mm-hmm. than the methamphetamine that comes over the border from Mexico. Yeah. Adderall is touted as, as a... Uh kind of a miracle drug of sorts for college students you know it's 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 one of those things it's just purely marketed to people that you know want to be able to focus and stuff and it's like you can kind of have the same argument as well for benzodiazepines you know somebody you know you have two people walk into a doctor's office one says that you know i can't focus on anything and it's just hard for me to get anything done because i can't focus and yada 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 here's a script for adderall and i'm an anxious mess and i can't really leave my house because um you know i i i just doc i'm so anxious i i i really have a hard time getting through my day because my anxiety levels oh really well what's that consist of tell me a little bit more about that and you know three minutes later you have a script for xanax you know they're touted as miracle drugs and listen again we're not doctors we're not this is all do not take any of this as medical advice but it's um it's just the same thing of you know hey take this pill everything's gonna be fine (coughs) This uh, this was interesting. I, I pulled an article up on this, and it says the ADHD medication shortage is getting worse. What went wrong? And this is from NBC News. <clears throat> and I'm just scanning it, and it said that um, Adderall prescriptions for adults rose 15.1% during 2020, double the 7.4% rise seen the year before. And I'm assuming, but I haven't seen a number in this article that, you know, it probably doubled since 2020. Oh, here we go. Uh, Since mid-2022, we found when a customer ordered more from us than what they forecasted, we were unable to fulfill those orders. Um, Told NBC News, we petitioned the DEA for an increase in volume when some requests accepted and some denied. Uh, That really doesn't say much, but I mean, you can you can read this article for yourself. Just Google it, you know, ADHD shortage or Adderall shortage. And that's what pops up first article. Let let me say this to that, though, too. Again, like, you know, at Rock, we have to and other treatment centers, we have to do these pre admission screens. I can't tell you how many clients tell us because part one of the questions is, do you have any past or present mental health diagnoses? How many of them say ADHD? They spend 90 days here, and I can tell you very confidently that about 90% of those people that said they got a past diagnosis of ADHD are not truly ADHD. Again, I'm not a doctor, but I've been in this field for 10 years. You know, we get a pretty good idea. If you're a nurse watching a medical doctor do surgery time and time again over the course of 10 years, you're probably going to have a decent idea of like what you're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. Same kind of thing. Well, while I might not be a medical doctor... I could tell you right now that the, these misdiagnoses are crazy, and it's getting even more out of hand. And going to what Tom was saying about benzos, like anxiety is a normal thing for most people. Like, and benzos. Did you guys see uh, on Netflix? They just came out with a a documentary on Xanax. No, Mm-mm. it's about an hour and a half. I think it's literally called Xanax. I'd, I'd have to double check that on Netflix. But um, I sat down and I watched it, and it. It talks about how it was intentionally, like, say, for instance, uh, you, you, there's a loss in the family, you, you, you're grieving, like, it, and got a lot of anxiety, can't sleep, like, it was supposed to be very temporary, you know, here, take this for a couple weeks, but it's turned into where people are being prescribed Xanax, and we see this for years and years yeah. and years, and 
the funny thing is, is again, like to, to put an idea to a lot of the, the insight that we get here, I just got a phone call the other day from a guy that he's a chronic alcoholic and gets on one of these Zoom sessions and the doctor prescribed him and told him to detox himself with diazepam, which is a benzo like Xanax, Valium, et cetera. Um, but the guy call, called our, our line saying, hey, man, like this doctor gave me this diazepam. I haven't drank in three days, but now I'm out of the diazepam and I, and I, I feel like like I need to go to the hospital or something. And I, and I did say to the guy, I said, look, dude, I'm not a doctor, but I will tell you right now. If you're feeling that way, you should get to the hospital as quickly as possible because the chances that you could have a seizure. And I was straight honest with him because he was like, well, why would the doctor prescribe me this? And I'm going to and I said to him, I said, I'm going to be straight up with you. That doctor was wildly irresponsible. Mm -hmm. If you were drinking the amount you were drinking and he's just going to fill a prescription of benzos for you and tell you to detox yourself. What's the motive behind that? Like, in my opinion, I don't have to meet this doctor to know that that doctor really doesn't care. Mm -hmm. Like, it could kill this guy. Absolutely. It's 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 insane to me. And it, it almost, it, no, not almost, it does anger me. Yeah. Steve, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I've talked and I've, I've spoken to alumni before who they try to, like, self-detox through alcohol uh withdrawal and everything and it's just it's a scary situation and i just say the same thing i'm like i i would go to the hospital you don't want to do this alone and everything and in terms of the xanax um being prescribed possibly over prescribed you know what i mean i think i don't know like i think we're you know humans are kind of a meant to feel emotions too i definitely feel again i'm not, I'm not a doctor either but like there's definitely a over prescription kind of epidemic you know um just in in our culture let me and make it's okay to feel things too you know no definitely and let me make something clear too like this is me and i'm pretty sure i can speak on behalf of rock when i say like we're or, or real recovery talk there for like we're not anti-medication no not at all I, we're not anti Matt, you know, I'm not anti Suboxone. I just mm -hmm. think that there's a proper way to do this. And appropriate and should be handled delicately mm -hmm. and um it, it and seriously, not just like the example you gave where the guy just over zoomed a doctor, I think, you know. Again, I mean he's a doctor, but in my opinion, like I would told the gentleman to probably should go to a hospital or a detox. And since we're touching on this, I think maybe some of our listeners don't know this. Benzos, such as Xanax, Valium, um, what are some other ones? Klonopin, mm -hmm. they and alcohol are the only two withdrawals that can kill you. Yeah. Like if somebody's on opiates such as fentanyl, heroin, whatever, like will they be sick and feel like they want to die? Yes. But benzos and alcohol is the, the only two withdrawals that can actually be fatal. Um, therefore, hence why it's so important with those like Within our within our system here, like if, if you're positive for alcohol or benzos, like you have to go to detox. Absolutely. We have to get you medically cleared. You know, we're going to want to do that for the opiate addict, too, because they're just going to be acting all crazy <laughs> going through withdrawal, you know, and impulsive. <clears throat> so that that film is um, I found the, the it's called uh, Take Your Pills. Semicolon or the two dots. It's a colon. Colon. Take your pills, colon, Xanax. And there's an interesting article on today.com, and I'm not one to normally frequent today.com, but they have an interesting uh, article on here, and it kind of goes into the a little bit of the um, untold truth about Xanax. So it, it seems to be pretty interesting. I think it's something worth watching, and maybe we can do an episode on it. Um, <clears throat> but there's a thing here that says a huge desire for a lot of people, especially in our gen generation is the need for a quick fix. And this, this film is actually, uh, directed. I just seen here by, um, uh, Maria Shriver and Christina Schwarzenegger, which is Arnold's daughter. 
And uh, people are scared, Shriver added. They're scared about the climate. They're scared about our politics. They're scared about their jobs. And there is Xanax, and people can buy it on social media. Listening to patients in the film describe how effective the drug is, it's easy to understand how someone might end up using it for years. I could almost feel it kick in with a click, like a magic elixir, one Xanax user named Scott said in the film. But there's a dark side for some. John, a middle-aged man from Colorado, was given a prescription for Xanax when he was in college, according to the film. He started out at one milligram dose, which over the years crept up to three milligrams. Everything seemed okay until his doctor reduced the dose from three milligrams to 2.5 milligrams. According to the film, the reduction kicked out a plethora of disturbing and scary symptoms. Hypersensitivity to sound and smells, heart palpitations, a sense of his skin was burning, brain frog brain fog and crushing fatigue, but neither John nor the many doctors he consulted made the connection between the dose reduction and the symptoms. When John finally realized his symptoms stemmed from Xanax, he began to slowly and carefully reduce his dose. Knowing what I know now, I would have never taken the first prescription. Let me throw this out there. Um, Alcohol and benzos are also the only two families of drugs that you can be cross addicted to. Mm. So hence why they use benzos to detox people off of alcohol. It literally works on the neurotransmitters the same. It is alcohol and a pill. Let me ask you guys, you know, if you, if you look at cultural acceptability, what would somebody say? Like if before I walked into work, whatever job it is, like I do three shots of whiskey in the parking lot and be like, all right, I'm good to go for my job. Chances are, at some point, I'd get in trouble. Ben, yeah. you, you smell like liquor. You're, you you got a buzz. Let me draw this distinction. There is no difference between somebody doing that and somebody taking a Xanax before walking into their job. Let's say they operate a forklift or heavy machinery. Can't get away with drinking, but the doctor prescribed this Xanax. They're, they're literally under the same influence. It's identical. Well, I think too, and 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 I myself am somebody that when you talk about cross addicted to both, I am that person. You know, I was addicted to alcohol, and I was addicted to Xanax and Ativan. Same thing. Um, but the way that it worked in my situation was, I knew I was a sophisticated drunk, Steve. Hmm. I really was. I didn't drink at work, but I did take Xanax, and every. You know, there was a point in time where I was taking Xanax every single day, um, more than the three milligrams this guy was taking. I can tell you that probably closer to, I don't know, six. I was, what were they? Two milligram bars, right? The bars are two milligrams. French fries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would, I was taking two to three of those a day. What? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. That, and that was just to get me through work because I was shaking so bad. And it, and like that said, that quote, it was a quick fix, like a magic elixir. It really was. And I have to believe that, you know, it wasn't as soon as I put it in my mouth, it broke down and, you know, I was relieved of all that, those symptoms, but there definitely was a placebo effect. As soon as that pill touched my mouth, I was good to go. But point is, is that everything Every accident that I got in at work, every engine that I blew up, every incident that I had was a direct result of alcoholism and Xanax, but primarily Xanax because I didn't have alcohol in my system. But I wouldn't be taking the Xanax had I not been an alcoholic. So like you said, Ben, You oftentimes see alcoholics cross addicted to Xanax because it does affect the brain in the same way. And the only other thing that I want to say about that is I didn't even have a clue. So when I went into detox, I blew a point zero zero. I didn't know. I didn't drink on the way down. I didn't drink on the plane and I get the treatment and I do a breathalyzer and They're like, well, you haven't drank. And knowing what I know now, you know, that's kind of a, you know, they can say, well, you, we can't, you can't be here. 
you know, you didn't you didn't drink anything. And an insurance company is going to look at that and say, we're not going to approve somebody to go to detox. It doesn't even show up to detox drunk. I just didn't know. But I did a urine drug screen and I had benzos in my system. And they said, you know, do you take anything other or do you take any prescription? And I'm like, well, yeah, I take Xanax, but I didn't know that there was even anything wrong with yeah, that. Come right in. We get that come right time. in, you know, and through the and so the point in saying that is the education that I had behind it, I had none. Yeah. You know, and I remember distinctly when I went in to the doctor's office, I basically said, I'm an anxious mess. And they go through the whole questionnaire thing. How much do you drink? Oh, I don't really drink that often. But when I do, you know, I get pretty tuned up, you know, so on and so forth. Meanwhile, I'm an alcoholic and I just didn't want to be honest about it. And, you know, it was just a swipe of a pen. Here's your Xanax and be on your way. And that led me down that path that like this article is talking about. And, you know, it was it was tough. It was really tough because there was probably a two or three year span where I was taking them every day, um, you know, and it was, it took months before my brain had actually like, you know, the fog had cleared enough for me to really, you know, realize how bad they messed me up. I'll throw this out there. I like using cases that we've had. We recently had a case, same kind of thing that didn't realize benzos and alcohol were the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's alcohol and a pill, you know, the, um, we put a lot of work into get, getting this lady into a detox. You know, she was drinking significantly. And we don't like to do this, but in this situation, we kind of had no choice. Um, we advise this individual to go to detox. And then we like seeing people come straight from detox into the into our program. You don't pass go, don't collect 200 bucks, door-to-door mm-hmm. transfer. However, there was some circumstances where this individual did need two days there was some stuff to take care of with the mortgage making you know assuring that they could stay long term with us there was a couple details Mm -hmm. that had to be zipped up it's real life but during that time so she gets detoxed and over the course of that two days didn't think anything of it i had a little anxiety i never mentioned i had a prescription to xanax took some xanax and next thing you know we're like oh here we go what, what, what do we do on our end now? Because you do have to be medically cleared. And the fact that this individual just got out of detox, you put that Xanax back in. Now the, the uh, chance of a seizure skyrockets again. You know, so it's like this person also was unaware. They just went through a terrible alcohol detox. And with, with not being educated on it was like, Oh, I never mentioned I had this like Tom was saying I have this prescription I didn't I didn't put two and two together I didn't know you know and it, it caused you know so we had to take some steps and it made the the case harder to to work with you know but there we go just not knowing and let me touch on this real quick because we're talking about being wildly irresponsible mm-hmm. these, these pharmaceutical companies and these doctors we're talking about French fries and Xanax bars. Why in the world do they even make a Xanax bar that's two milligrams? Mm-hmm. I can understand the footballs. We call them footballs on the street. Yeah. The 0.25s the orange, uh... and the 0.5s. Mm-hmm. But a two milligram Xanax bar, if any three of us took one of the one right now, with the we're all we've all been sober for a significant period mm-hmm. of time. We have no tolerance. We would legit be blacked out, right? We would not remember our day. Bro, I'm, I'm like, I'm um, glad you said that because it, first off, like Xanax is, it's weird. It's kind of like a lot of times people's first experience with it, if you use it, you know, um, uh, addictively is like kids going to their mom's cabinet because like it's just so prevalent, you know, which is part of the problem, you know, and like oh, and taking Xanax. Xanax is super powerful. Like I've done Xanax to use, never been prescribed, but to, to get high a handful of times in my life. And, uh, each time I don't rem- I still don't remember. I mean, it was years, years ago, but like, I don't remember. I still don't remember. Like days, I don't remember. 
And I mean, I'm like, I don't weigh a lot. I have a, I always had a low tolerance and stuff like that. Like it was the bars and I just, I took a, like I took one, I probably took one or two of them. And each time I didn't like, I was just extremely just, I could imagine driving. Thank God I didn't drive, you know, uh, at the time. I did drive at the time, but I think it was like at a party or I stayed at my friend's house or something. But the point is like, this, this is super powerful substances, you know, like extremely powerful. And you talk about the education aspect of it. Uh, I still think as much as maybe we take it for granted because we're in the, in the rec- recovery uh, treatment um, field, but like how little education there are, there is on like pills. Like it, it's still the, 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 um, the idea that, oh, the doctor's prescribing it, that means it's, like, not as bad as some drug you'd get on, you know, from, like, the homeboy on the street or whatever. But that's not the case. This shit can be like even more uh, deadly. Well, it makes it even, it makes it a harder, th- it makes it harder to sell sobriety. Yeah. It makes it harder to tell somebody, hey, you should probably get off of that. And uh, because, look, I don't have a doctor it degree doctorate Mm -hmm. degree Um, but I do have experience with working with you know thousands of people at this point when it comes to getting off of this stuff and you know reality is now uh, the vast majority of people end up in their addiction through some sort of pharmaceutical grade medication at some point and maybe not the vast majority but a lot of people you know you talk to people that have opiate addictions or they're addicted to fentanyl or whatever the case is, you know, it started from, Hey, I fell off a ladder. I'm a construction worker. I fell off a ladder. I got into a car accident. I broke my leg, you know, whatever the case is, I had surgery or, you know, you never know. And then fast forward X amount of years or whatever. Uh, and they find themselves in our facility, mm-hmm. you know, so to, to, to pretend like, you know, doctors have your best interest at heart is just being absolutely foolish and ignorant, you know, uh, and, you know, honestly, it's, it's, it's kind of a shame, but Steve, something that you said that I do think it makes sense to talk about a little bit, um, is you said something we're humans and we're meant to feel emotions, Yeah, you know, and I think that there's a good, there's a lot of good, uh, points in that because, We are a society now that almost feels like we're not supposed to feel these things. And if we do start feeling these things, then we have to figure out the easiest way to get out of it in the shortest period of time. And that's where I think, you know, Xanax, Ativans, uh, Adderalls and these things start coming into play. And the advantage to, you know, us being in recovery for so long is... We are open and accepting of feeling these emotions now. And, uh, you know, it's a it's a cool thing for people that are in recovery that like, listen, I get anxious. Mm -hmm. I get stressed out to the max. You know, there's situations where I'm scared or I'm nervous or, you know, maybe I have a heart palpitation and all of a sudden I think I'm dying, you know, these sorts of things. It's normal human nature. And I think in the end, it is our body telling us, you know, something's going on. You don't want to mask that stuff. You know, Xanax and these sorts of things. I can understand if you have debilitating anxiety and you need to take something for 30 days, I can sign off on this. So as long as okay ben i'm the doctor you're me ben your anxiety is so bad to the point where you can't even leave your bedroom that's got to be a tough place to be i'm gonna go ahead and write this script for you but just know this is for 30 days and that is it i'm not gonna write you another one but alongside of this 30-day script you need to do x y and z You need to get a therapist. You need to download Headspace or some sort of meditation app on your phone. You need to start figuring out, I don't care what it is, Ben, start, you know, rubbing essential oils on your temples, something to help you figure out where this anxiety is coming from. And in 30 days, we're going to get rid of this and you're going to be able to deal with this anxiety because anxiety is nothing but fear inside of our head. 
It all takes place in our mind, but anxiety left untreated turns into panic, you know, and that's probably why you're debilitating. You can't leave your room because you have fear that you're going to have a panic attack. Is that right? Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, you know, I get it. And this is, this kind of sums up, I think, everything about what we're talking about is these doctors again like this is this is shortcuts Mm -hmm. you know there is no treatment plan from what i see behind like hey get on this screen i need this pill and let let me throw it at you like this too i'm a guy who's well educated on this stuff i could absolutely get in front of a zoom doctor and tell them everything that they need to hear to write me a prescription yeah if i'm an active drug addict believe me i can get on there there's no drug test you know, oh, do you do drugs? No, I don't. I can get a script. I grew up down here in South Florida um, when all the doctor shopping was going on. You know, I graduated high school down here in 2002. Doctor shopping was huge. At one point, there was a documentary about it back in the day called, uh, I think it was called Oxycontin Express, but it was a documentary. 97% of the oxycodone in the United States came out of Broward and Palm Beach County. I, I was born in Broward County, grew up in Palm Beach County. 97% of the oxycodone came out of two counties in the entire United States. But with that being said, like, I also don't want to, you know, bash these doctors. The doctors, doctors go to school, right? And I'm willing to believe that 99% of them, you know, they take the Hippocratic Oath, they have good intentions. And I'm not going to sit here and pretend like, you know, ethically, morally, that their motives are bad, but they're just not trained on this stuff. And, oh, yeah, I did follow up. We talked about it an episode or two ago. I said I was talking to our doctor here at Rock. She's a medical doctor, Dr. T, and she is also an addictionologist. She had to do a, a pretty extensive course to get the addictionologist uh, credentials, but she was talking, I called it the X factor last episode. That's, this is what they've done. I, I clarified it with her come in the next couple months. I think she said March, um, doctors will be able to prescribe Suboxone without what's called an X waiver. So they would have to go through the DEA, you know, you know how doctors have to get a DEA number. We have to have one here at rock, et cetera. Um, but they no longer have to register with the DEA and get like special permission and training to be able to prescribe Suboxone. They're literally Congress just passed a law where they're opening it up where any doctor can prescribe Suboxone. And this is where the problem lies. Mm. These doctors are now not trained on things like Suboxone. They're not trained on things like Xanax and they're prescribing it, you know, willy nilly. You know, because their job as a doctor is to address the physical. Like, and I learned about, we learned about this in school, you know, from the addiction perspective. Addiction is so much more than the physical. It's the physical, it's the mental, it's all the underlying issues. But we had a professor that explained it very well. A doctor is looking at the physical aspect only, a medical doctor specifically. You know, if, if somebody's going through opiate withdrawal, they give them an opiate, the opiate withdrawal is gone or in this case, an opioid, Suboxone, problem solved. They only take into account one small section of, of what needs to be addressed. And like Tom said, there needs to be a treatment plan that goes along with this stuff. That can't be cut out. Yeah. I'm assuming when you say any doctor, it's got to be like a medical doctor, not like Dr. Joe Biden or somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that'd be kind of crazy if like, you know, you have a a doctorate in dance theory and, you know, you're, you're able to push out subs. But. Doctor in drama or something. Yeah. And Tom and I, we've talked about this on a previous podcast, but maybe people didn't hear it. Tom and I had the opportunity to go to a local hospital, what, over the course of like three months? Yeah, it was last year we went down to um, JFK North and got to speak to all their residences. Yeah, every other week we got about an hour and a half, two hours, where we sat in front of, what, 10 to 20 doctors each time. Yeah, it was different. Um, 
like depending on where they were in their residency. So there were like level one, level two, level three. You know, I could, I don't know. Yeah, it was a lot of doctors. Yeah, I mean, I, I could probably guesstimate. We probably spoke to maybe a hundred total. I would think a hundred. Yeah, that's over the course of three months or so. Mm-hmm. But and and they were awesome. Like, let me throw that out there. Going back to what I was saying earlier, like these doctors, they they truly wanted to be able to help. And they told us in person, they never got any training on this because the topic of Suboxone in particular came up. And, you know, we talked about our experience with Suboxone and they were like, we had no idea. I'm like, yeah, people are coming into treatment these days and their drug of choice is Suboxone. It is ruining their life. Crazy. Per the client statement, you know? So it's like, and dude, they were so open-minded and looking for the education but you can't expect doctors to know every aspect. They're human beings. Mm-hmm. Like, I really had a lot of respect for them. And they sat there. Dude, I was really taken back how many questions they asked us. You know, a, a, there was one in, in particular where one of the doctors started crying. And she was like, I just feel so helpless when I see these guys and these girls coming in for alcoholism, for opiate addiction. And I don't know what to do with them. Mm. Like, we get them better physically. And then we just, they're out. And then they're back next week. And they, they were talking about how hopeless they feel. And it, it went back to they, they just don't get training on that medical school. They have to seek it like our doctor, seek extracurricular, you know, uh, what's it called? I don't know. Something like CEU. CEUs. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was looking for. Continuing education units. Yeah. You know, the other aspects and specialties that doctors can go into. But uh, they're just not getting that training. So I don't want this podcast to be like poo-pooing on doctors. They, they don't know what they don't know. And, yeah. you know, and I think it will. I eventually I feel like it will be required just the nature of the way things are going in terms of addiction. And well, it's required now. That's the problem is that it's it's there. It's not going to be required. Oh, or you mean the training? No, I meant I meant like the, just the knowledge in terms of like the effects of just the addiction. What is it that, that Dr. T has the addictionologist? Yeah. That's not required, you were saying, right? No, no, yeah. it's not required. I feel some version of that will be eventually. I I I I hope you're right, but I I think you're wishful thinking. It's possible, but you know, I I do think that in half of my tin foil hats on, I do think that this is motivated by big pharma, you know, and they hold the cards and you know, whatever they say goes. And, you know, it's it, I, we have a serious uphill battle. I mean, for God's sakes, we know what the leading cause of death is in the United States. Right. You mm-hmm. guys know this heart disease. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Correct. And what, what causes heart disease? Uh, Bad food yeah. habits. Yeah. Lack of exercise. You know, just it, your diet in particular. But you can there. there's no talk about it. No, I've always wondered this in like. You know, when you see the presidential debates going in the the midterm elections and all this stuff, like it's always talk about, you know, wars and, and, and uh, you know, um, uh, just all this, all the political stuff that they always bring up taxes and wars and schooling and education and so on and so forth. I'm waiting for the day when somebody that is running for president or whatever governor, I don't care. Somebody brings up the fact that like the, the, the amount of food that we're putting in our mouth is killing us. It's not all this. I mean, it's so easy for us to focus on COVID and all this other stuff. And, but in the end, it's like, you know, stop eating Reese's pieces and and big gulps and you're going to live longer, Ben. Will I? Yes. (laughs) You know, it's just that is the reason that I think it's wishful thinking, because we know what causes heart disease. It kills a lot of people and there hasn't been a darn thing done about it. As a matter of fact, you want to talk about pharmaceutical drugs being prescribed. They're now prescribing pharmaceutical drugs to children who have obesity. So rather than telling the parents Stop giving them McDonald's every day and maybe um, get them out from in front of the TV and have them go exercise. Take this pill. Damn, bro. You just black pilled me on that. I changed. I agree. I, I, you, you talked me into it. We're screwed. Crazy. We're screwed. There's, I, I, 
Didn't they just flip the food pyramid or something? I, uh, I it's don't. really I do feel I feel <laughs> definitely when we were kids it was different. We were taught about exercise and eating healthy and all that in the food yeah. pyramid. Well, here's the thing: when we were kids, I wasn't necessarily taught about exercise. I wasn't. I mean, I just had, but it was a known thing that you go play outside. Yeah, common sense. There wasn't the all this stuff like you know. My gosh, my. The phones and everything like you didn't have access to that. Mm -hmm. It was you go outside, you shoot birds off the power line, you do whatever you're going to do. You know, like yeah. you go out, you have fun, you build forts and stuff. Come in when the sun comes down. It wasn't exercise. It was play. Yeah. You know, I was never educated on it until I got old enough and started seeing some of my buddies at, you know, the Bessemer Barbell that. I'm like, what's this all about? You know, and then I started, you know, learning about weight training and stuff like that. But it wasn't really taught. And we had nutrition classes. Yeah. In my school. I mean, but I don't know if they have that anymore because I know it's a lot of it's very, you know, it's almost unfortunately politically incorrect to talk about um, a positive, right. a positive lifestyle of like eating healthy yeah, and, and everything. You know, it's whatever. This is a different topic. Yeah. For another day. I will touch on, I do want to touch on this real quick because maybe this is somebody's first time listening to our podcast. Like, what quali qualifies us to talk about things like Suboxone? I just want to throw it out there. Maybe, maybe some of you haven't heard. Like, I have personal experience with being on Suboxone. It was so physically, like, I became so physically dependent on it. It was worse than heroin. And I'll throw this out there methadone in particular, I was on for an extensive period of time and it did two things a it ruined my life like i have never been more addicted to a sub substance than i was methadone mm -hmm. and you know you can listen to the past episodes i go more in depth on it so i was more physically addicted to that than anything else in my life hands down ruined my life that is the drug that brought me to my knees at the same time i want to throw out there it also did save my life in a way like my tolerance for methadone was so high that literally heroin could not kill me like i was doing huge shots of heroin but because of the amount of methadone that i was on like it's almost like i was immune to heroin mm -hmm. so it, it did in a way serve its purpose like it destroyed my life spiritually mentally physically but it also kept me alive long enough for me to get to the day when I was like, this stuff is controlling my life. There's nothing enjoyable about it. The cons are outweighing the pros, and I wanted to get clean and sober. That was beautiful, Ben. It was. And I think that's that's like the only, honestly, my experience with Suboxone was using it, just buying it on the street to, as a, to get off of Oxys and Roxys. Honestly, that was my experience, and I never went to a doctor for it never, or anything. Um, I, I mean, I know that wouldn't have worked for me. It would just continued. But that's what I meant, like, for the pro. It keeps you alive, you know, so maybe one day you will hear a message of hope and then and, and be in the solution. That's the main pro, I mean. But I just, from what I've seen, like, I've just, I don't know if I've known anyone who's, I mean, what's a successful Suboxone run? Like, you do it, and then you wean down, and then you're, yeah, you're good. I, I don't know anyone. Like, I'm sure there is. I'm just saying, like, I don't know personally. No, I have not seen the anyone do that successfully. The methadone clinic I was at was a nightmare. I never passed a drug test there. It was terrible. It was a money maker for them. At least that's how I see it today. Was I part of the problem? Absolutely. <laughs> but let me throw this out there. I got to know the doctor that was prescribing me Suboxone. Um, <sighs> I believe she had told me at the time she had been doing it for eight years and she was retiring and she had told me, she's like, I've been doing this for eight years, prescribing Suboxone. And she said, I've only seen one person successfully taper off with me. Mm. The rest wow. of them relapsed and went back out. This lady, like her and I had gotten like a pretty close relationship for whatever reason. She really took a liking to me. You know, I during the time that I was on Suboxone, I was a true drug addict junkie that really wanted to be sober. And I think I think she could see the desperation in my eyes and like how bad I actually wanted it. I wasn't somebody that was just 
taken Suboxone to take Suboxone. Like, I, I think she could see it in my heart and in my eyes that I wish I could be clean. I was just incapable of it at the time. But yeah, she openly got very vulnerable with me. And she told me the reason I'm retiring is because I've never seen anybody. I've seen one. She said one girl successfully was on Suboxone with me for two years and successfully tapered off and is now clean and sober. Like, that was really cool of her to share that with me. That is. You know? Mm. And, you know, I wanted to touch on my personal experience because I don't want to throw it out there that, like, you know, there there may be some... This is going to happen. I, I can almost guarantee someone's going to listen to this episode and then in the comment section, someone's going to be like, Suboxone saved my life. I've been on it for 10 years. I, I want to make it very clear, like at least my intention, I, I know you guys well enough, mm-hmm. we're not trying to bash people that, that are on Suboxone or Methadone or, or Xanax or whatever the ca- Adderall, whatever the case is. Like, that's not what this is about. We're not here to sit here and say, like, this is the right way, it's the only way. We're just simply sharing our experience. Absolutely. And like Tom always says, I don't think there's an argument on the face of the planet where, where you can say that there is no better outcome than somebody living a fruitful life completely abstinent. Mm-hmm. It is like one is definitely better than the other. Can somebody have a life on Suboxone, Xanax, Adderall? Sure. Is it going to be as productive, as meaningful, as purposeful as someone who's totally clean? I'm willing to bet probably not. You know, I would just hopefully this message is like not somebody doesn't take it as they're being bashed. I just hope Absolutely that somebody not. can see that the hope that one day you two can have the best possible outcome. And that's total abstinence and purpose. And, and I like, I'm glad you said that. And I think, and I'm not trying to bash in terms of anyone that's on, it, if they feel that's their solution, but if, if they don't feel that their solution and they, I just want the awareness of if you got on Suboxone and thinking you only wanted a short period of time and it's you've been on it longer than you've wanted to be um i just know there's it's a it's a, going to be a battle you know and to possibly look into getting help you know i want to i want to ask steve a question we got to wrap this up then. let me ask yeah. steve this last question what's up there's no right or wrong answer to this i'm just curious what your take on it is will you sponsor take somebody through steps that's on suboxone or a maintenance drug Ooh. Um, that's a hard one, and it's something that's actually kind of a possible crossroads with that's happened to me in the last few months. No, I'm going to say no, but I'll say this: it's not like I'm. I'll sit with you and I'll read with you, but we just and I'll read and we'll, and we we'll, we can hang out and talk recovery for hours. I don't care, you know. And I'll always pick up the phone, but I'm I'm not. It's for me for the just spiritual awakening and the real gifts of the steps. I don't know if you can get that on being on Suboxone. That's a fa- that's a fair answer personally, and yeah. I but and I will do all the reading in the world. And when you get to that point, if you want it, when you and I'll help you get off of it. You know, to the best of my ability. But that's just that's just my philosophy with it. Yeah, so I'll I'll share my take on it real quick. And again, there's no right or wrong. And I have sponsees that are now sober sponsoring guys. And this comes up, they'll ask me. I'll get a phone call. Hey, Ben, I some guy asked me to sponsor him. He's on Suboxone. He's on Methadone, marijuana maintenance, whatever it is. And they ask me, like, what do I do? Do I tell them no? And my personal take on it, again, there's no right or wrong. This is my experience and opinion. Like, I have taken guys through mm-hmm. steps that are on Suboxone and maintenance drugs. Um, and for me, the reason is, is like, if somebody wants the time to get that, have my time and get that knowledge, I only see it as that they could have the help in the future and like come out of the gate flying, you know, like the day they make that decision, I do want to be abstinent. They already have like a big understanding. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my, my sponsor taught me we're not in the results business. We're in the business of showing up. And like, like for, for me, and this is just for me, I don't get to decide like, wh- you know, who I should and shouldn't help. Like if somebody asks for help, unless I'm not capable of helping them, for me, I'm probably going to say yes, you know, and, and 
I've seen it go both ways, man. I've had guys that I took through steps that made a decision to get off Suboxone after the fact, and then I've taken guys through that fell off. But I've had guys that were trying the abstinence route that fell off in their middle of their steps. So, very, very fair. So it's like, yeah. dude, if somebody's asking for help, I'm just the kind of guy that'll go for it. Yeah. You know? But each person has to decide that for themselves, and that's what I tell my sponsees. You have to decide for yourself. And I won't sit there and tell somebody, like if somebody on Suboxone is telling me that they have a sobriety date and they're sober, I'm not going to look at them and be like, you're not sober. I've had that and I don't, I just, it's almost in my head. It's it's not, I don't say keep the point? keep coming back. It's like patronizing, but like in my, I'm just like, okay, I'm not, I don't want to, it's, you know, I don't want to be a dick to be, to how, you know what I'm saying? The guy's alive. It's a family friendly show, Steve. Excuse me. Like, I don't want to be a, a, a jerk. You know, I've had that. I've had someone say, and this is my clean date. I've had people say I slipped up on alcohol, but I'm not counting that. You know, I said, okay, maybe we'll, you'll you'll feel different. And I'd still work with them. You'll feel different, and you'll want to change your clean. I don't know, you know. I've run into this actually daily. It made me think of another thing. When we do these pre-admission screens that I talk about all the time, yeah. one of the question questions is, what is your sobriety date? And, a, like, you'd be surprised. The majority of the time, the person I'm talking to doesn't know. Uh, and, no. and the case manager is usually in the room. <laughs> and you'll hear the case manager say, what day did you get here? Oh, let me look. And they look it up. And whatever day it is they got to the detox, they call their sobriety date. And, so, and I'll throw it in there, but I'll let them decide. I'll be like, hey, well, that's the day you got there. Some people wait for their sobriety date to be the last day that they finish their Suboxone taper uh -huh. or their Benzo taper. I said, but that's up to you, man. And they're usually like, I'm going to go with the day I got here, which is cool. Like, it, it's not my place to decide that. But I just kind of throw that out there so that they can make an educated decision for themselves. You know, I kind of use that as a gauge of, and it's probably unfair to the client. <coughs> but I, I can't help but use that for as a gauge of their willingness if I ask you your sobriety date and you don't know, I don't know. I mean, because I knew. Yeah. You know, I knew when I was done. I knew the date. I knew the day. Or I could come up with it really quick, you know. But there are, like, situations where they're like, I don't know. I have no idea, man. Does it matter? <laughs> like, yeah, it kind of does, mm -hmm. you know, because it's a pivotal moment in your life. And if you can't remember it. I don't know. And, and, and like I said, it's unfair to the client because they could just be, you know, maybe they're suboxoned out. They literally don't even know what year it is. Yeah. Who knows? But it is a benchmark of like a new way of life. Yeah. Potentially. I honestly, I count my day when I when I went into treatment as my You would. When uh oh, Steve has yeah, to change the sobriety oh, no, I'm not. It's March 29th. But I, <laughs> I will say, but I was like, I wasn't really, I think they just gave me a volume for like two days. Yeah. Like I count, I, was my, I, count I count the day after I went to detox, but listen, That's I don't. They they gave me Librium, and I don't think that was anything. Like right, Librium's a benzo. Eh, whatever. It's a, re it's a really weak one, dude. Yeah. Like, yeah. What's about volumes? It a ain't a French fry. Va but volumes a benzo. Yeah. Right? Whatever. Okay, I'll change it to. I'm not changing it, but I'll change it to freaking. <laughs> uh, I don't know. A a April first. Or whatever. No, I'm not going there. But <laughs> April Fool's Day. Yeah, April Fool's when Day. When is your sobriety day? It's March 29th. Of and what? I, of um, 2009. And you're gonna be how sober? 14 years. 14 coming up. God willing. I mean, I think I got it. I don't know, <laughs> I man. I got, I'm recovered. No. <laughs> yes, yes, he is recovered. I'm not cured. With an ED on. I, I'm re I'm in recovery. All right. So then we're done. Are we done? Good. I'm good. I'm, I'm having fun. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But well, the battery's on, hot, yeah. on that thing. Well, and uh, it's hot. And we're getting warmed up. And we need to work out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're going to have Steve on here in the next few episodes to discuss the differences between Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. Um, because there is a lot of, uh, let's say, um, healthy... Brotherly. Brotherly, sisterly... I mean, because there's females in both. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's fair. Debate, well, debate amongst the two. Rivalry, rivalry. It's okay. Yeah, it's like the Steelers and the Ravens. Don't you know? now you're upsetting me. They kind of love <laughs> each other. The, the Steelers and the Browns <laughs> is traditional rivalry. That's true. Yeah, Steelers and the Browns is the traditional rivalry. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, stay tuned for that. That's going to be in the next probably three, four episodes as soon as we can. Uh, you know, 
hold Steve down for another hour. But uh, that's it, Ben. You good? Oh, I'm good. That was fun. Thanks, that was Steve. fun. Absolutely. Steve, you good? I'm good. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning into this episode of Real Recovery Talk. In the end, if you would like to reach out to myself or Ben, you could always email us, Tom, at realrecoverytalk.com and Ben at realrecoverytalk.com. And in the end, ultimately, what we are trying to do, Ben, is... Turn your mess into your message. That is it. We will see you all later. That was nice.